Hi, welcome back everyone um, to the main stage. Um, so in this session, um, we're going to, this is part of the uh, one of two perfect practice sessions. And this one, um, we're really pleased to welcome Adam Parnell um, to talk about charterships. Um, Adam is the professional registration account manager from the Institution of Engineering and Technology. Um, so Adam, I'm gonna let you talk. Hopefully people will post um, questions in the chat which i will field at the end um so uh really looking forward to uh hearing what you've got to say thank you so much great thank you susan and, and thank you for inviting me to come along and talk this afternoon um i do i have one of my colleagues strategically placed in the audience to help answer questions in the chat as we go so please do if you've got questions fire them into the chat um, and if I see them, I'll try and cover them um, it, you know, it, it, as best I can, but I've got a colleague in there who's gonna answer questions and I may drop some useful links and things in there as we go. And as Susan said, I'm, I'm from the Institute of Engineering and Technology. There are many institutions out there that are licensed by the Engineering Council to offer chartership as well as as well as other levels of professional registration such as incorporated engineer or engineering technician or even incorporated uh, sorry even um, ICT technician so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how we do it at the IET but it's also very similar with with other institutions as well um, and we always say join the institution that feels like the right the best fit for you um, when it comes to becoming professionally registered so the IET has been around for a very long time. Um, you can see here, we started out in 1871 and we've just celebrated our 150th birthday. Um, we do have a, a strong heritage um, within the electrical sector because we spent a long time as the Institute of Electrical Engineers and we merged in 2006 with several other institutions to, to form the IET as it is now. And we're a multidisciplinary organization. So we look after engineers and technicians from all disciplines, all walks of life. Um, and that makes us one of the larger institutions out there. We've got 169,000 members and we operate in 150 countries as well. Now, when it comes to becoming chartered, part of the process is to be assessed by your peers. Now, as a, multidis uh, a multidisciplinary institution, you can see that our members come from all different walks of life, just as I said. And what's really important is, as part of the assessment process, we will link you up with other members um, who have been through this process themselves, and they have the right engineering knowledge and experience to be able to assess you on your path towards becoming chartered, which I'm going to tell you more about later. Now, as an institution, we're licensed by the UK Engineering Council to assess and award the four different levels that you can see on the screen here. So the big one, the one that most people um, are familiar with is CENG or, or Chartered Engineer. Sitting just slightly beneath that in terms of responsibility is Incorporated Engineer. And then in the technician end of things, we've got Engineering Technician and ICT Technician. Now, at the IET, we also have a partnership with um, the CMI, so we're able to offer chartered manager as well as these different levels. But I'm going to focus on the path towards becoming ING or CENG for the, uh, the purpose of today's session. So just a few points around each of these in terms of what's required. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these statements, but the slide deck um, I will be sharing with um, the guys who are um, organizing the event today and I'm sure they'll be happy to share it with you if you want to disseminate this in more detail um, but I'm just going to focus in on these top uh, these top statements here so you can see for CNG it says develop new or existing technology that's a statement that often scares people away it's not necessarily about being able to say you've invented some new gadget that's changed the world or anything like that it's more about um, being able to innovate being able to look at the status quo and improve upon it um, and that can happen in some really simple ways. Now for CNG, the question that I get asked the most is, how many years experience do I need before I can um, apply for and become um, a chartered engineer? And it's not an easy question to answer because everybody's journey is very, very different. But we have what we call exemplifying qualifications that I'm gonna to talk to you about in just a minute. And if you have those, then normally, 
the minimum amount of time is around four to six years experience in industry after you graduate so that's 426 not 46 just in case my accent is throwing anybody off so similarly for incorporated engineer if you have the exemplifying qualifications then it's more like two to three years experience in industry after you graduate and you can see up here the statement says to maintain and manage applications of current and developing technology what we really mean by that is that we want you to be um, involved in that innovation process but you don't necessarily have to be responsible for innovation now for EngTech and ict tech we're really looking at the ability to apply proven techniques and, and procedures um, so it's all about the doing rather than the the theoretical stuff um, so I talked a little bit about these exemplifying qualifications and I really, really want to, to stress this point. There are no mandatory qualifications required to become professionally registered at any level. So the people that, that come to us to become registered, they have a mixture of all sorts of different qualifications. They have, some of them have, you know, just everything we can see on the screen here. Some of them have these qualifications, but they might not be accredited. Some of them have qualifications from overseas. Some of them have some of these qualifications, but not others. And actually, some of our strongest chartered engineers have no formal qualifications to speak of whatsoever. So don't panic if your intention is not to do an MEng or a master's degree. Um, it really, um, it really doesn't matter. I mean, these qualifications where they will help speed up that journey. But what might surprise you is 68% of our applicants, uh, our successful applicants don't have these qualifications. So what they do is they demonstrate their engineering knowledge through work-based learning. So um, if you have these accredited qualifications, great. They make the application process a lot simpler and easier and they help you get there faster, but don't panic if you don't have them. We will still get you there one way or another. So, when you decide to become professionally registered, you're going to be assessed against something called the UK spec. Now, this is a document that's written by the UK Engineering Council. It's quite dry reading. It's about 46 pages long. Um, and I promise you, if you struggle to sleep at night, then this will really help. Um, so I'm not suggesting that you download this and read it cover to cover. Um, but you can find on the IET website, and I'll share the link later on um, if I get the chance, we have a condensed six page version of this, which um, for where most of you are at right now is absolutely more than enough. And all, it, all this is really is a list of 17 competencies in which the engineering council is saying, if you want to become professionally registered, then you must demonstrate your experience with each and every one of these 17 competencies. And you can see it's split into five different areas, A, B, C, D, and E. So A is all about your knowledge and understanding. That's where those exemplifying qualifications that we talked about earlier come into play. B is about your application to practice. Now that's your experience in industry and that's why becoming professionally registered is so valuable to employers because it's not just about what you know, but it's also about what you've actually done. It's about how you've taken that knowledge and put it into practice as well. Section C is all about commercial skills. So you can see up there, it says leadership and management. Don't panic. You don't need to be a people manager to become a chartered engineer. When the engineering council uses this word management, they use it quite literally. So um, it might mean management of time, resources, budget, managing stakeholders, managing expectations, that kind of thing. Section D is all about communication skills and E is all about ethics. Are you working safely? Are you working sustainably? That kind of thing. I can see we've had a question in. Um, would you recommend applying for EngTech, ICT Tech as a stepping stone to see Eng? Now, that's a really good question. And I wanted to answer this one verbally because to be honest with you, um, everybody's different. Uh, everybody's journey might be different. So some people come to us you know, well into their career and they've got loads of experience and they go straight into becoming a chartered engineer. Some people become a, uh, an engineering technician and, and that's enough for them and, and that defines what they do um, really, really nicely and there is no need to progress any further. And the same with incorporated engineer. So 
some people kind of look at these qualifications as um, completely separate qualifications and others see them as a stepping stone, as a journey um, towards reaching the end. Probably the biggest jump is to go from Eng Tech to ING because Eng Tech really were looking for a level three kind of level of qualification or experience, which is like a, an MVQ or an apprenticeship, something like that. Um, whereas for um, an incorporated engineer, we're looking for a bachelor's degree level of experience and a minimum of two to three years experience in industry as well. So that's really where the biggest jump comes in. Whereas then from ING to CNG, it's going from a bachelor's degree level of knowledge to a master's degree level. And really, we're looking at four to six years experience in, in industry. So that's not as big a jump going from ING to CNG. And people often ask me, you know, should I go for the ING right now or should I go for the CNG? And I always say to them, look, if you can see yourself being ready to go for the CNG within the next two years, then go for the wait and go for the CNG. If not, then get the ING now, and that will help you on your journey. It will help you get CNG level experience. Um, and help you get you there faster. And there's a really cool tool that I'm going to show you in just a moment that shows you how to map out this journey and how to speed up, accelerate that journey as well. So there is lots of great support available from my team at the IET. And we run something that we're really proud of called the GRS or Guided Registration Support Service. It's completely free. I'm hoping that my colleague in the chat will share a link to the GRS um, service in the chat for you. And um, what will happen when you sign up to GRS is we assign you an account manager, somebody within the IET to act as your guide on your professional registration journey. It doesn't matter if you're years away or if you're really, really close to, to submitting, but um, they will point you towards different workshops and webinars and activities that will help you along the way and you can see we've got an, an example of some of them here so every week we do live professional registration workshops we do registration guidance callbacks competence development workshops technician workshops probably the most important ones are the pra one-to-one -one sessions the professional registration advisor one-to-one -one sessions so the pras are volunteers who are engineers, they've been through this journey themselves, they know it very well, and they're happy to spend their time one-on-one -on -one with you in video calls to talk about your experience and help guide you through this process, and even look at your application form later down the line and say, is this gonna be successful or not? And if not, why not? And what do we need to do to make it a success? Um, so that's a really, really useful tool to be able to access. And I can see my colleague Katie's just shared the link to GRS with you guys as well. So please feel free to, to use that. It is a free service um, and we're really proud of it. It works really, really well. So I really want to show you this career manager platform because there are some tools on here that can really help kind of navigate your journey towards being ready to apply. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come out of this slide deck. And I'm going to take you on to the IET website here. Um, one thing to know is if you want to get onto the career manager platform, you do need to create an online account on here. It doesn't matter whether you're an IET member or not, you will be able to create your account here. And then you can click on this little button that says go to IET career manager, which you can see I've already got the tool open right now. And it's a fairly simple tool to use. I'm just gonna give you a very brief tour around here before I show you our competence development tool. And I think this is what you guys are gonna find the most useful on here. So you can see we've got some tabs along the top. The first one is around CPD or continuing professional development. And it's important to note that if you're a member of any of the engineering institutions, you have this commitment to keep a record of at least 30 hours of CPD activity per year and most of the, the institutions will have a platform like this that enables you to record it so you can record your CPD here if you wish to. We've then got the professional registration um, area so this is where I'm going to kind of focus um, where I'm going to talk about today so I'm going to come back to this in a second. After this you've got schemes and apprenticeships so if you're currently enrolled on an IET accredited scheme you can link your account to that scheme here and then one thing that's really, really useful that I wish I'd have had 15 years ago when I started my career 
is this little professional profile space. It's just a really useful space to keep a record of your employment history, um, things like training courses that you, uh, you may have done. So it's just a useful, safe online space to, to record that information. Now, what I really want to show you is this competence development tool. And whether you're planning on going through um, and being registered with the IET or another institution, these UK spec competencies are exactly the same. So this tool is going to work just fine regardless of, of which journey you're going to go down. But I really want to show you. So it's this first box on the left here. And what you get when you open this up is you can see the different levels of registration. So you can see CNG there, ENG Tech there, ING down at the bottom there, ICT Tech. We also have this SOFIA framework. So if anybody's more ICT focused, you, you can still become registered as an engineer through your experience within IT. And you can do that using this SOFIA um, framework assessment on here. Can be quite tricky. Um, so if anybody does find themselves going down that road, please reach out to my team and we'll be happy to, to kind of walk you through it. But I'm just going to focus on the CNG one here. So if I click on this, this is where the real valuable stuff is. So and remember, this is the same for all of the institutions, these 17 competencies from the UK spec that you can see down the left here. And they are a very well thought out broad set of competencies. So we've got the list of competencies on the left on the left in the middle we've got a skill level of zero to four and these um different skill levels actually align with the different levels of registration so you can see level one is trainee you're learning how to do a task that's the equivalent of engineering technician or ict technician level two is supervised practitioner you can perform the task but require some supervision and that's the equivalent of incorporated engineer and then level three is practitioner. You can take full responsibility for and are completely competent in performing the task. And that one's the equivalent of chartered engineer. And then we've got expert, which is a bit of a mouthful, so I'm not gonna read. So on the right hand side, we've got a detailed description of what is required for each skill level for each of these competencies. And this is a really powerful tool, especially if you're you know, if you're just finishing your time at university and, and moving into the workplace, it's powerful for two reasons. Number one, you can really start to map and, and charter your, your uh, professional development in the coming years. So when you first come out of university, you know, you might have some twos, you may even have a three, you might have some zeros. These might be all over the, all over the place. Now, what's really great is to get a mentor and if you can find one in your place of work or you know within your environment, fantastic. But if you can't, the IET has a completely free mentoring service where we will actually we'll, we'll provide you one of our volunteers to act as a mentor and help guide you through this. And the idea is you can make sure the ticks are accurate through support from your mentor and, and through support from us as well. And when you know they're accurate, then you can start to pick off the areas that want development. So you might say, okay, D2 is one that I really need to develop on, clearly present and discuss proposals. So what opportunities are out there for me to get that experience and move this tick up here? And when you do, there's a little evidence box on the right hand side. So you can start to keep a record of what it is that you're doing that puts you at this skill level. Now, this is another reason why this is so useful because you're actually preparing your application form for chartership as you're gaining this experience. Whereas what a lot of people do is they, they wait until they're 10 years into their career and then decide they're gonna sit down and have to write about everything they've been doing for the last 10 years. Whereas here, it's all um, being recorded as you go. It makes that whole process at the end so much easier. Now, another area where this is so powerful is being chartered, being registered at any level is um, it, it's a very powerful message to send to an employer. Um, it says to them, it demonstrates your engineering competence very, very clearly and directly. But even if you're not registered yet, just saying to a potential employer that, you know, I'm working towards chartership, I'm using this competent assessment tool to manage my strengths and my weaknesses against the UK spec. These are the areas that I really want to develop on in the next few years. That's a really powerful message to potential employers. They absolutely love that. They love to see 
um, people coming through who are taking hold of their professional development and, and really driving it themselves. Um, so it's a really useful tool to get on board with and, and start using um, for so many different reasons. So once you are ready to apply and become professionally registered, um, if you're going to do it with the IET, then you're going to find the application form here in this middle box. And you can see all the different levels that you can apply for through us. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick look at what it, what a CNG application looks like, what it actually takes. And it's actually far less work than what most people imagine it is. So if I just click on the one for CNG, you can see we've got a whole bunch of tabs down the left hand side. And effectively what we're going to build here is something that looks like a CV. Um, but normally your average CNG application form is about seven pages long. And when you see, um, if I just go down to the review application and show you what this uh, application form looks like, when you see all of the boxes and the admin on here and the IET logos and declarations and things, you will fill seven pages very, very quickly. So it's actually, you know, less is more, very direct and concise. And all you need to do on this application form is tell us about your uh, employment history. And as you're telling us about that employment history, you need to demonstrate your experience with each and every one of those 17 competencies and when the time comes and you're ready to apply we have like i said earlier so much support available to you there are workshops multiple times a week you can reach out to our team you can have your own account manager to walk you through this um, we make it so super easy now so there is no excuses not to do it as soon as you're ready um, Something that I hear a lot, and I heard it from the IET, um, the, 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 our most recent president who's just stepped down to make way for our new president, Danielle George. Um, she said, you know what, don't do what I do. I left it until years into my career to become chartered, and I wish I'd have done it sooner. And I hear that from so many people. Um, just, you know, hunt this down as soon as you come out of university or if you're already out and you're in the workplace, use this competence development tool and, and other institutions they all have similar services just like this to help guide you on that journey and do it as fast as you can because the earlier you become professionally registered the more benefit you will get out of it the more it will help benefit and drive your career and i'm gonna um kind of wrap up what i'm saying here and move on to q a by just saying one one last fact and this is one of my favorites because i'm all about money i love money um, I'm a greedy guy, and um, it is that professionally registered engineers earn on average £11,500 a year more than their non-registered counterparts. So there are so many good reasons to become professionally registered, but for me, reason number one would be really simple. I want to make as much money out of my career as possible. We go to work, um, you know, because we love what we do, but also we do it to... To, to bring home the bacon and, and pay the bills as well. So this is a great way to drive your career. And, um, you know, it's, it's not as hard as what people imagine. And it's not as much work as what people imagine. And there's so much support available, um, then, you know, please do it. And all I would say is, if you do need any help or support or guidance along the way, pick up the phone and, and reach out to us because that's what we're here for. We're, we're here to help. So. I'm very conscious that we've got until 20 minutes past before the session ends, and I wanted to give five minutes to do Q&A as well. I can see my colleague Katie has been answering questions furiously in the chat, so thank you, Katie, um, for helping out. Um, if there are any questions that have, have gone in the chat that um, Katie hasn't answered, please can you just copy and paste them in again, and I will do my best to answer them over the next few minutes. So do we have any questions at all? Thanks, Adam. And thanks, Katie. I think that double teaming has worked really well. Well done to Katie behind the scenes. And <laughs> um, that's been excellent because there have been a lot of questions in the chat, um, which is great. So thank you, Katie. And thank you, Adam, for such a structured and really informative talk. So what I heard there was um, do it early. <laughs> Crack on, I heard. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I often encounter working, um, just while we're looking for questions to come in, one of the things that I often hear uh, 
generally, but I can see it really applying to this, is people get into a job and then they're so focused on you know, doing the job that they don't allow time to do things like this. I know a lot of the training is on the job. Mm. Clearly, there's a lot of support there. Um, one of the things that I'd like to add as, as an employer, if you like, is um, make sure you put this on your development plan when you get in. So when you talk to your manager, have it on your development plan, and then that then gives you permission from your uh, manager and your employer that you're intending to do this. Yes, Adam's right, they love it, they love to see it. They love that you're forward planning your development, but make sure you have that conversation because otherwise time runs away with you and you feel bad, you know, for, for um, pursuing it. I, I, I think probably women more so than men, um, massive generalization, but yeah, get it on your development plan. Are there any other barriers that you hear um, that people encounter to, to not doing it early that, that you, you'd like to kind of share with the group? Um, there are, there absolutely are, because your uh, people's careers tend to go off in all sorts of directions that they, they didn't expect. And the number of people that have come to my team and said, you know what, I've been putting it off for, off for years. I now have several people that work for me that, you know, um, that, I should be setting an example for and I feel like I should become chartered now to set that example yeah. and we look at what they do and we say well to be honest you're, you're too far away from the engineering now to become chartered you have to have been a practicing oh, right. engineer within the last five years so when you start to become more of a manager and you start to move up within a company structure it can become harder and harder to become professionally registered and something that I did want to share that we've seen really just in the last year is that um, I know the number of, of uh, or the proportion of women in engineering is, is around 9%. I think it has grown slightly in the last couple yeah. of years. We've seen a real surge in, in female applications for CNG in the last 12 months. So right. it, it surged up to about 13, 14%, which prior um, to this year, it was around 6 to 7%. Which are wow. ridiculously low. So it was a huge surge that we had in the last year. Yeah. What was think, that down to? I I don't know. I really don't know. And I mean, I can see Elizabeth's correcting me with some some more accurate data here. Um, yeah. So and that doesn't but, describe the jump you've seen though in a year. No, it doesn't. I mean, we look at these demographics really carefully, and we um, we try so hard to make the process appeal to everybody and, and yeah. suitable for, uh, to everybody and, and be inclusive. But uh, I don't know, I think it might be something to do with this shift in, in working patterns over the course of, of COVID yeah. last year. And I think people have got a little bit more time now yes. while they're working at home to focus on things like this. So I think we're picking up people who are becoming registered now who probably wouldn't have normally because they were busier in their, in their day to day. So yeah. maybe that's good. it, but um, we Yeah, will good point, making time hmm. to, do, to do development. I think this has been a really excellent session, Adam. I know, and Katie, must have met Katie. Um, <laughs> I know people will have follow on questions. You've already said it, you know, please do get in touch. So I, I definitely second that. Do get in touch with Adam and Katie via the IET website, or have you got contact details up there? But um, I'm sure he's happy to continue the conversation. Thank you so much, both of you, for a brilliant, brilliant session. Um, and welcome. get on it, everyone. <laughs> yes, please do. And uh, thanks again for having me on. Um, so enjoy everybody the rest of your day. I think it's going to cut out any second now. Um, <laughs> but, um, yes, thank you and, and take care. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Adam and Katie. Bye bye now. Bye, everyone.